What's up? Here's my uh, travel partner. This is how she usually is 99% of the time. She had her first bear experience last evening and she started going crazy in the truck without seeing one. And uh, she smelled one. We thought she smelled one. Me and my friend are driving around looking for bears and stuff. And and then she's just going absolutely nuts after sitting here all calm like this forever. And then a few more kilometers on, she did it again. And then a few more kilometers, kilometers, we saw a big bear on the road, running down the road, and we didn't see nothing. And we waited for her reaction. We got to where that bear was. Uh, she went absolutely crazy again. It's funny what a, a dog knows, what they smell. Imagine having the nose of a dog. So anyway. Go back up this long road again, and it'll be interesting. I'll, sh I'll show you guys what she does with a bear. Excuse me. All right, so this is the Sony camera. This is the one that I usually use out in the uh, out in the woods, only because it's it's small. It's it's uh, easy to put in my pocket, and I have batteries that last like an hour. No, sorry, I've got batteries that claimed to last. It says it'll have four hours of, of batteries, etc. Life on the battery. <laughs> but um, quick answer to replies. Or when you guys see, when I'm making a video of this camera, and all of a sudden I saw a flash of distortion. Unfortunately, this camera, which is probably my fifth one of this flavor, when I hit record and let it rip, and it automatically ends uh, recording and begins a new one on its own. And when it, it does not transition smoothly, it makes that distortion. Don't know why, it's frustrating. I'm over this brand of camera, this style of camera, whatever it is, and I, I need a new Wicked Outdoor camera. I just haven't, uh, haven't had time to research and find out what's, what is a good one right now to use out in the outdoors, which I normally do. And another thing too is I have so many batteries that will fit this camera. That's another frustrating thing too. If I dump this brand all together and go somewhere else, I have uh, hundreds of dollars of batteries that are now going to be useless to me as well. But this camera is somewhat annoying. <laughs> I don't even know what it's going to be like in here once you get on the edit program. It doesn't matter as long as you guys can hear the voices being heard, right? So, 
what is it? It's early uh, Wednesday morning. I don't know what the date is. I've got a truckload of fir logs in my yard that needs to be bucked up. I think I got about a cord and a half done yesterday and there's a lot more to go and it's really hot out. And then I have another, uh, I don't know what I have, 1400 feet of wire fencing I got to put up around my property because um, of the goats and the dog. The dog the odd time rips across the fence but the goats have been ripping it underneath the fence and ripping over to the neighbor's place and the neighbor finally came over and said he put Roundup everywhere and, and uh, on a side by side he came over so I go yeah I think my goats have been over there the odd time he goes yeah they're there every day I'm like oh man try to train two, pi two uh, pygmy goats whatever they are dwarf goats so I had to go and buy a whole pile of mesh fencing and I got to get the rest of that on to uh, keep everybody contained in here and not get shot next door or something or poisoned or whatever, right? And then of course while he's complaining about the goats, Willow, the one of the other horns, she goes and jumps up onto a side-by-side -side seat and stands there and stares at him two, two inches from his face. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, enough of that. I got voices to be heard. Voices to be heard. Got a flood of emails related to yesterday's share. Appreciate them all. And uh, all I got to say in that is moving along, right? Moving along. So, one thing that I would hope to get people to possibly look into while we're looking at this topic and more is, is to hopefully get everyone to realize that, I feel anyway, that um, we need to figure out our own shit clearly, I believe, before we get to have the answers completely to a few other topics when it comes to this crazy, absolute crazy ride called life. I am firm, firmly convinced for myself, we really need to figure out our truth really, really badly. I, do, I don't think we will be able to fully comprehend or understand what the hell's going on we will to a point. I do believe we will to a, a much higher point than we have previously in generations, but uh, we need to figure out who the hell we are. What can we do? What could we possibly used to do smoothly? And why we are being so controlled and steered and manipulated so intensely. Why? But we have to figure out our own shit before I think we can fully understand or wrap our noodles around this topic and more. I think. What do you think? Right? But anyway, no babbling, short babble. Let's listen to this. You ready? I was a skeptic. Now I know. Let's title this email. Dear Steve, I hope this message finds you and your loved ones healthy and happy. I've written you before and heard my experiences read by you regarding the subject of the Sabe people. When I first came to Georgia 40 years ago, I did not believe in the existence of the Sabe UFOs or ghosts. Now I know that all of these entities exist. I had an experience with ghosts in the house of my first wife's grandmother after her grandmother's death. Needless to say, it was an eye-opening experience. I've seen a red light hover near the field where my deer stand is and then speed off straight away and disappear. What is more disturbing is that the experiences I have had with the Sabe have been in the same field that I hunted. I have yet to not stop hunting in that field because I just can't let any of those experiences keep me from hunting deer. I have to pl plead the blood of Jesus over me and the friends that I bring to the area to hunt. Excuse me. I also bring corn every deer season for the deer and the sabe, and I tell them I bring extra corn for them as a thank you for staying out of each other's business. Last year I took oil and blessed it and anointed my deer stand and the land in the name of Jesus. No problems or pressure from the sabe in the past few years. I talk to them when I get there that I'm there to hunt deer for my family. I've done this because of the experiences I have learned from on your channel. All the people who contribute to this channel are much appreciated. It has made my life easier and much less stressful when I go hunting. Golden! That's really good to read that. Thank you, Steve, for your willingness to share your experiences and the experiences of others in the club in a return. I stand willing and able to share your channel with others who have shared my experiences. 
as well. As we say in the infantry, I have your six. Keep up the good work and keep your head on a swivel. Sincerely, Mark D. McCall, Ph.D. Okay, Mark, good luck hunting, man. I'm glad you uh, pushed through and have arrived to the place you are now, right? It's a good place to be. Still living. Still living. Doing what you're passionate about. That's the key, right? That's one of the goals we have on this channel. I do. Anyways, to help all of us to come together to help people smash through this terrifying potentially absolutely terrifying experiences that people are having and they didn't ask for it, right? And they got nowhere to go to figure out what's up. So that's a good email. Appreciate it, man. And good luck out there. Steve, I attached what happened to me when I was camping in the Great Smoky Mountains with my family when I was around 8 years old. I'm now 56 and I've lived with this ship for 48 years, so yeah. I have a lot bottled up inside me. Never stop doing what you're doing. I'd follow you to hell and back. You have no clue how much you're doing for all of us who know these damn things are here and the shitwads who say we are stupid and clueless. We know the monsters are real. Thank you so damn much, man. Sincerely, Jeff Chalfa. Okay, man, thanks for the kind words. Let's get into it. Steve, live in Virginia. And we are around three hours from the Great Smoky Mountains. I was around eight years old, so this is about 1971. I'm 56 now. I went with my family to the Smoky Mountains, and we went camping. The campground we ended up in was kind of off the beaten path and up in the timber. There were other families there, but not a lot. Later in the evening, the other kids and I were out passing football. There's another guy around my age, but the rest were girls ranged from 8 to around 12 or 13 years old. It was around dusk, so the light was fading away, but not enough that we couldn't see the football, which was orange, so we could see it. As we were passing the football around, and one of the girls threw it way over my head, and it went into the woods. The campground was surrounded by woods, so we were in there pretty deep. I went after the ball, which had gone about 15 to 20 feet into the woods and down the embankment. I remember getting the football, and when I looked up, about 20 to 25 feet on the down, on the down, the embankment, I saw what at first looked like one of those wooden statues you see at a tourist location, etc. I wonder why a statue would be there until it moved. The rest of this thing stepped out from behind the tree. It was beside of, sorry, one more time. The rest of this thing stepped out from behind the tree. It was beside of, and we stared at each other for four to five seconds. I've never seen anything as humongous as this thing. I remember it had some gray around his chest area, but not, but never really got a good look at his face. But it was huge. I was frozen and couldn't move. It moved so quick behind the tree, it almost disappeared. It was that quick. I ran as fast as I could back and told everyone that King Kong was in the woods. That was the only thing I can say that it looked like. The adults went and looked in the woods, but it was starting to get dark, and they told me I'd probably seen a bear. And this wasn't a bear. This was a monster. The only person that believed me was my dad. We talked about it just a few times when I grew older, and he believed me. My dad was a World War II Navy vet, and like your grandfather, the best generation this world has produced. I lost my dad when I turned 17 years old to a massive heart attack, so... Your sight, Steve, I have attached what happened to me when I was camping in the Great Smoky Mountains with my family when I was around eight years old. I'm, I'm now 56 and I've lived with this ship for 48 years. So yeah, I have a lot bottled up inside me. Never stop what you're doing. I would follow you to hell and back. You have no clue how much you're doing for all of us. We know these damn things are here and this shit was. I just read that again. Weird. I think he had a major, uh, you screwed up a little bit there. Your email was copied and pasted halfway through and then half of it, uh, pasted again. Anyway, got through it. I got it, man. Sincerely, Jeff Chalpa. Got it, got it, got it. I'm glad this channel's helping you. Big time.
It's helping me too. It's helping a lot of people. It's amazing the, the speed, right? The speed has been a... Uh, one pattern is the speed for certain. The pattern of the speed thing, I'm meaning... Uh, the speed has scared a lot of people. Just the speed. And I remember... Who was it? Dr. John Bendernagel, I think he told me of a man on Vancouver Island driving along and said that it was the speed of this thing. They came out of the out of the bush and whipped down to the edge of the river and started to drink water with his hand. He said the speed of that thing was absolutely terrifying. And I know a girl who lived in Courtney, she's riding a horse along, and the speed she said of this thing that ripped across the trail in front of her was absolutely terrifying. This big black thing. The speed, right? Strong pattern speed. How do they do that? How does something so big move so fast instantly? Like even a moose. I mean, moose can rip along pretty good. A grizzly bear is grease lightning, that's for sure. But they don't go from zero, zero to 100 miles per hour in a tenth of a second. There isn't an animal that does that. They got to start going, right? So how do they do that? How do they do a lot of things? More people. Another man enters the club and overturn, right? Welcome to the club. And nobody asked to be in it. No one. Denial of what is seen simplifies, simplifies denial of the unseen is the title of this email. Hi uh, Steve, thank you for your unswerving devotion to exposing lies and to spreading knowledge and truth. Virtually shouting from the mountaintops as it were. I'm a man, a month from being 73 years old. I do not wish my name to be shared with strangers. My name is blank. <laughs> you could have put your name in the email. Alright, hold on, let me get this. Alright. Your frustration from trying to accomplish so much is understandable. It is difficult to know where to begin when there's so much that needs to be said, so much that needs to be heard. I suggest you go about doing so the same way that someone would go about eating an elephant, one bite at a time. <laughs> gotcha, man. I appreciate your dilemma, as I try to put so much information into one, hopefully not too long, email. I chose, quote, denial of what is seen, end quote, as the subject of this first bite of what seems to be an impossible task, which may, may never be completed. You have often asked why the truth of the existence of a race of giant human-like beings with enhanced abilities, which we humans may have dormant in ourselves, despite generations of non-use, is being suppressed, covered up, denied, and met with militant, contemptuous outrage and ridicule by mainstream, quote, science, end quote. I must smile as your commentary on Friday's video touched upon what I had written as an unfinished draft. I should have finished my email and sent it in on Thursday. I suggest a simple answer is that by successfully denying the existence of physical evidence of what countless eyewitnesses have been reporting, proof, for over 200 years, by covertly covering up such evidence, such proof, and repeat, repeatedly denying its existence, the existence of proof. These people, in quote, control of the narrative, end quote, can subsequently more easily deny the existence of things, unseen and unproven, such as horrific agendas and criminal activities, such as ridiculous spending, the election and, and election fraud, for example, and anything and everything beyond the narrative they wish to force upon their minions. It is an insult to human dignity that, as you mentioned Friday also, the sworn testimony of an eyewitness to a crime has the credibility to lead to the conviction of the accused perpetrator of the crime in a court of law, yet that same witness, where he or she to testify <clears throat> under, excuse me, under oath that he or she saw a particular cryptid phenomenon or UAP, he or she would be considered a liar, as crazy and demented, as hallucinating, as seeking 15 minutes of fame, and any other such discreditation. Discreditation. <laughs> Those who control the narrative often attempt to project the image of being kind, all-knowing, and wise, 
by offering the witness who comes forward with a story about a sighting the option to admit slash confess that they must be mistaken. Is that not ridiculous? The witness is offered only three choices by the powers that be and must choose one only. The choices are, one, they are mistaken, two, they are lying, three, they are insane. The mainstream narrative is ruthless. I've heard it said that typically eyewitnesses, being human after all, will not argue beyond three denials of the accuracy slash truthfulness of their story by an uncompromising challenger. Several years ago, I watched a comedy sketch on a on TV late night on a Saturday night in which a lady walked into her bedroom and found her husband in bed with another woman. While the husband was firmly denying that she had really seen what she had literally seen, the other woman, in plain sight of the outraged wife, got out of the bed, got dressed, and left the room without a word. Within minutes, simply by a repeated denial by her husband of what was seen, the wife began to question that she had actually seen what she thought she had seen. And eventually, if I, cor if I recall correctly, apologized for her false accusation. The motion, the motion picture industry, which always seems to know about what is really going on, and leaking such information in sci-fi movies, always promotes the narrative that U.S. presidents are not allowed by the real powers that be to know about what is actually happening for the sake of his plausible deniability. That is, to give the presidents the credibility to convincingly deny anything and everything that it has been seen, which the unseen powers do not want to be seen. That way, the president can claim in the style of Sergeant Schultz from the old TV show Horgan's Heroes, I know nothing and be believed. In fact, there's no doubt in my mind that he knows nothing, lol. <laughs> no shit. You're absolutely correct in my opinion when you say that providing the existence of Sabe is not the issue. That ship has sailed. He's already been proven. Though as Scott Carpenter's book shows, the proof, truth, has been denied. Bigfoot is only a false flag for the issue. The issue is for the deep state to control every narrative so that only the opinion of those in control, Big Brother so to speak, is presented and accepted as fact. When this happens, the people, having no say in the matter, will have lost any and all control of their lives. Two plus two will no longer equal four, and the sky will no longer be blue. Both will be whatever Big Brother says they are, and arguing will result in punishment as severe as Big Brother may deem appropriate. Keep fighting for the f Keep fighting the fine fight for the faith, brother. Appreciate your email, man. I always get kind of a little tinge of excitement when I hear um, the person sharing with us is one of our senior members of our community. As I, uh, I am firm, firmly convinced that we really need to listen to our senior members of our, of our communities. Period. Unless they're in politics or a member of some kind of frickin' popular reality TV show. <laughs> Other than that, game on. I want to hear from them. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you, read, you know, sending that in, big time. And I agree with you across the board. Without a doubt. Who's next? It's funny, a lot of a lot of emails I could hear from the people and just sit and listen for a long time. It's almost like it's too bad it ended, you know what I mean? Especially people that are uh, very intelligent, independent thinking, aware individuals. This is titled a Big Daddy Sasquatch. Hey Steve, looks like you got your studio coming together really nice. Congrats on a hard job of sticking to a project, especially with all the irons you have in the fire. This is a picture of the big male we have in our previous homestead in Longview, Washington. Those are cottonwood saplings around 10 feet tall across from our upstairs window in our bedroom. He's a good 11 feet tall, peeking over the tops of the trees. There are some more of his gang down below him if you zoom in left to right. They can see my wife sitting in, they can see my wife sitting in her recliner from there. That picture was taken from, I'd say, 40 yards away. There's an orchard to the left of the cottonwoods. You can't see from that angle and 
It's on the edge of the power line right of way that they travel back and forth from the Columbia River about a quarter mile, about a mile away. Sorry, excuse me, you guys. These guys don't give me much trouble, but scare me sometimes when I'm cutting grass. I never get used to it. They are very stealthy. When I turn that brush hog on, they don't like it and fill my yard up with rocks to try to get me to not cut so much grass and briars. It takes from their cover. Okay, Steve, be safe, Jack, and Carrie Willis. Wow, sounds like uh, you got a lot more going on than just what you mentioned in this email. Interesting. I wonder if you've had any go missing or any animals get killed or any bad shit happen on your property. And if you've had any clear, absolute, in your face um, sightings with these things. Longview, I think that's where I went, isn't it? Didn't I go to Longview and I met up with Dave? Went to, uh, what did we call it? Convention at that casino? Beautiful beach there. That's, I'm pretty sure that's where I went. Longview, that long, beautiful beach. It was pretty incredible for me to see that. Most of our beaches are a rock and short beaches. But anyway, there you go. There's another photo, you guys. Take from what you will or leave it. Possible sighting in Sanford, UK. Hey Steve, I've been watching your channel for years now. You can use my name, Andrew Morris. In 2018, myself, wife, and eight-year-old son and brother and sister-in-law with their children went on holiday to a log cabin resort in Dorset. Anyway, we let the children go to the on-site play park, which like the rest of the resort, surrounded heavily by large trees. After a few minutes, both boys ran into the cabin and said there was a big black man with huge muscles and no t-shirt watching them from the bushes. I went down to the park with the boys, went behind the bush to look for him. There was nothing there, but the boys said that they could only see him from the waist up. When I went behind the bush, they could only see my shoulders and head, and I'm five foot seven. Love the reports and the awesome man cave. Okay, man, thanks for the kind words. And, uh... I'm super stoked that you listened to the kids and didn't brush them off. We gotta listen to the kids, right? Gotta listen to the kids. It's funny, uh, in the, was a couple years ago or whatever, when people started writing in from the UK, covered in frickin' hay. I'd feed the horses before I come in here and I got little chunks of hay all over the place. Um, it's funny how a few people from the UK email me and say, you know, I'm quite certain that there is, uh, Sasquatch exists in North America, but not in the UK. <laughs> right? Meanwhile, more and more people from the UK are coming forward. Basically every country in the world, right? Keep listening to the kids, everyone. Always listen to the children. Always. Always. This is titled, I was very young. I might have read this. Did I? It's short. I can't remember if I, I can't... It says red beside it, but I'm not sure if I just did that or not. I've got my two copies in me, alright? This is not one of those exciting stories that keep you on the edge of your seat. I've followed you for about a year now. The other shares encourage me to share this. Looking for your take on what I was told. I'm 63 now. I was seven or eight at the time. My family was living in Elk River, Idaho. The town was very small. 300 people in the town and many of the houses bordered the heavy forest. You could go out to your backyard or be in the heavy timber in 50 feet. Our alley behind the house was where we left our trash cans. My dad had to buy a new trash can probably five times while we were living there due to the can being smashed or ripped apart by something. My dad always told me that it was grizzly bears. I was wondering if they could slash the side of a galvanized steel garbage can like it was butter. <clears throat> Excuse me, also my parents were panicked about me even stepping foot in the forest area. I asked if that was where the bears lived and my mom said yes, or something does anyway. I was confused, but she never said anything else about it. What do you think, bear or Sasquatch? I respect your opinion, even if it is a not sure. Love your channel, Steve, and watch as much as possible. Go ahead and share my name. 
I don't have many friends or family that watch your stuff. I don't care anyway. James Anderson. Uh, okay, now, um, uh, Grizzly Bear can basically do whatever he wants. Without a doubt. And no, I haven't read that. But I have now. And I'm marking this next one as read ahead of time. Uh, I had a guy from Alaska who emailed me his trail camera photos, because he saw that I was right into trying to catch crazy shit with my trail cameras. And he had 45 gallon drums, steel drums, old fuel drums, and the big ones, not the little ones. And he was filling those with bait and chaining them. The size of the chains he used to chain to the trees was enormous. And uh, he had these monstrous brown bears. They're like type, they're an offshoot of grizzly bear, but they're much bigger, right? And they were turning those, those cans looked like uh, if you took a beer can and went, <laughs> they were absolutely beating the living shit out of those steel 45 gallon drums and squashing them. But I didn't see any tears, nothing tore into it. So for me and what I've seen, I've had lots of bears. We've had bears come into camp. We've had bears kick in the doors of our cabins, grizzly bears. And they basically open anything, but you got to think about it this way. Why would a grizzly bear try to hold a galvanized garbage can with one wide open end and cut it open with his claws? Doesn't even remotely make sense. Could they? Yeah. Yeah, they could, but it sounds like what you're describing is more like, like um, claws through paper. It's what I think you're probably talking about, maybe possibly, I don't know, it wasn't there, but um, it's hard for me to visualize that any a black bear, no, grizzly bear would be the only thing that could possibly pull that off, would it do it, I have a tough time picturing a grizzly bear doing that, holes for sure, teeth holes all the time, uh, gas jugs, oil jugs, we used to leave our saws and we were kind of trailed horses up in the middle of freaking nowhere, all we do is we wouldn't have any hunters and we're going to go see a new country. And we keep going out. And we would put, uh, you know, what a normal vehicle motor oil container is, right? One liters. We would we'd both have a couple, of two guys usually, we'd have uh, two of those full of mixed gas. And then another thing for chain oil. And then uh, we have that over our saddles, in the back of our saddles. And um, we actually have a scabbard for the chainsaw too. And then we would cut trail for the day and then leave our stuff at the trail head and then go back to camp for the night. And uh, it wouldn't matter what you left on the ground. If it's not, if it wasn't natural to the area, the bears have to t try it out. But they didn't shred it open with their claws. There were always teeth marks, always. And the fuel jugs, if they get to it, <laughs> they gotta taste it. <laughs> they bite into everything. Everything is always teeth marks from bears. So. The typical horror movie slashes. No. So my vote so far it wasn't a bear. But I wasn't there. And there you go. That's what I got. Here's another one. This title experience. Watching your show, it occurred to me that I could share my experience. Perfect. My wife and I lived for years on the edge of Overflow Creek in North Louisiana. One year we began to hear strange noises at night cutting across the back edge of woods. Never had heard sounds like that before. One night in the living room, suddenly, the most awful smell began permeating through the wall into the whole room. It smelled like the worst rotten carcass I had ever smelled. Skunk ape comes to mind. It had to be standing there. Now, I had never had any problem opening my door at night and marching outside, but at that moment, I wouldn't open that door. I've taken many a white tail, tramped through the woods during darkness, seen all manner of wildlife, but this experience got me. I'm convinced it was one of them. You've convinced me it's one of them too. Please don't use my name, but this has been on my mind for years. There you go. <clears throat> if it's been on your mind for years, you already know. You already know. Without a doubt. That's the one thing that you can pretty well say with confidence, don't you guys think, is if you, no matter how minor you think the experience was, um, 
if you've been holding on to that one one experience in your whole life and then finally get are compelled to write it in and share it with all of us here <laughs> you already know what it was I'm guessing you already know what it was but it's good you have to write in write it in all right what's this one mark this is Brad there's so many people that need to be heard, you guys. There's so many. Hey, people, get right to it. I've had a number of encounters of these beings ever since I was a child. I never really knew it. After I saw, after I saw physically saw one while elk hunting near Packwood, Washington, I basically snuck up on it, watching some runners stretch, which of course pissed me off since these kids ruined a, a great place to spot elk. But the hell can you do? I basically snuck up on it watching some runners stretch. Oh, some runners. So people run. Some joggers stretching. Gotcha. Runner stretch. I thought that was a name for a pathway or something. That's kind of creepy. Well, I was kind of watching them. Something caught my eye to the left, and that was my first encounter. I have no doubt that it knew I was there, but, it's, but still kind of freaky. I quickly left the area, got in my truck, and left her home. And didn't tell the joggers, right? <laughs> I've had a few other whoops, howls, and some wood knocks around the Stevens Pass area of which, of which close to where I grew up. I never really felt like I was endangered from them until on June 23rd, 2019. I did a solo hike to one of my favorite lakes in the area, Lake Ethel. I've done it many, many times in my past and didn't think anything of it by hiking there alone on this day. I started off and everything was picture perfect. No wind, no extraordinary sounds, just my footsteps, birds, and the occasional light wind rustling whatever it could grab. I made it to the lake and it was starting to get a little cloudy and the wind picked up, so I thought I wouldn't fish and started heading back to the truck. We have been caught in summer snowstorms at this lake in the past and didn't want to take a chance. The trail from the lake heads up a light ridge and then follows it a little bit, then crosses some power lines, and then switch back to the trailhead. When I reached the top of the ridge, I heard something about 1 to 150 yards to my left. Sorry, 100, I meant to 150 yards to my left. Thinking it was a deer or a bear running away, I sat there watching it to see if I could get a glimpse of it, but didn't. So I started heading down the ridge. So did the steps, thumps and snaps, followed me as well. When I stopped, of course, it stopped. It started to creep me out at this point. When I made it to the power lines, I felt a relief since it was wide open and you can see both directions as well as all around me. Another group of people consisted of three adult ladies and six kids were coming up the trail. Not to alarm them, but to warn them, I told them that a deer was messing around, <coughs> excuse me, was messing around up further up the trail. This kept the eyes open and looking around without scaring them. When I was done looking at the views, I started off back down the trail. And here is where I got really frightened. And I've seen combat while I was in the core. During the switchbacks down, this thing knew exactly where the switchbacks were and would stop and go from most western point of the switchback to the next western point and not following me the rest of the trail. It knew exactly where I would be at the particular time and would situate itself to ambush me. Luckily, it never did. Made it back to my truck, got out of there, never been back. The next day, I bought a pistol and holster and always take it with me in the woods. 40 years of hiking in these woods, and I've become a huge believer of you and Dave's message in an hour episode. I asked a forest service worker about the area, and he slash she told me that they don't go up in that area unless they absolutely have to because of weird things that take place up there. And a local Sasquatch dude here, an honest, knowledgeable, good guy in the field, they are, there are some, and I am lucky enough to have one locally, said the same thing by saying that there are some weird things happening up there. Anyway, since that day, my head swivels. My pistol slash rifle is ready to go when I go hiking now. Hope things are well. Take care, Stan. There you go. Man, you put me right back to when I was a kid with that one. Right back there, because that's what happened to me. Only, I don't, I can't say for sure when I had that experience, which is similar to yours. I can't, well, 
I wasn't doing switchbacks. I was going up over a, a pass, down the steep side, and it wound down like right, and uh, going through the pass as usual. Hair on my body is freaking on end, like uh, just feeling so sketched out, and freaking nervous, and vulnerable as f. And then, um, but I didn't hear anything. And I'll tell you what, if if a mouse could fart at that time, I would have heard it. It was dead, dead silent. But that thing was on that rock bluff ahead of me down the trail waiting for me. 110% waiting for me. Not a, not a doubt in my mind. Sitting there perched on that thing waiting for me to come down and then peek at me, watch me from up that rock. It was so close, so close to me. I remember that threatening. I felt so freaking threatened. So threatened just a bow and arrow and I was probably 17 years old or something I think I was 17 possibly 18 more than likely 17 and uh, that's a that's not a cool feeling is it it's not a cool feeling <clears throat> when you said but it's funny you know when you mention um, you know you got a gun you got a pistol and a rifle ready to go I think sometimes when I go places I, I bring my gun but I, in my mind I'm not I'm not practicing in my mind, getting my gun up fast, or getting ready to go. I just bring my gun to make a show of, I can do something if I have to. <laughs> to, and not specifically to these Sasquatch Sabe beings, but to whatever the hell might be out there that may be intelligent and looking to, looking to uh, do something not so cool. Because I, I don't think that, it's like grizzly bears, and I tell a lot of my hunters to come out north, a lot of people are, I call it paranoid, they're, they're terrified of grizzly bears right away. Lots of grizzly bears around here, you ever have any problems with them? And that tells me right away they're nervous about bears, right? And then uh, some people really make it clear that they are scared of the grizzly bears. And I'll try to calm them by saying, look, just relax. Because they're so intelligent and so swift, if they want to kill you, they're going to kill you. If a grizzly bear really wants your ass, he's going to have it. There's nothing. Not too much you can do about it. They're too fast, too intelligent, too stealthy. And if they're looking to kill you dead, all they got to do is go up ahead on the trail where it's a little thick in the bush, sit there and wait, take out the horse. Done deal. <laughs> You're not going to get the gun out of the scabbard. Ain't going to happen. You're not going to get a knife out of your sheath. He's just going to pull you off the horse and pop your head like a pimple and carry on. Anyway, I'm pretty certain that the majority of these beings, whatever the hell they are, can do that as well. New problem. But for some reason, and from the patterns from all the people t sharing their experiences, the pattern, one of the patterns that I've learned for me is due to their body reactions, their verbal reactions, their facial reactions, they have directly let us know that, yep, guns make them nervous. There's no denying that one. Guns make them nervous. They don't like them. And if our guns were harmless to them, they wouldn't react when the guns come up or come out. They wouldn't at all. Why would they? But they do. And that's telling us flat out. Well, it looks like putting a hole in you isn't that good of a thing, is it? So, what I'm saying is for you guys, I, do I run around with a gun like I'm ready, I'm like ready to go? Nope. You see me in my videos, I just casually pick it up like it's a crescent wrench and put it beside me. There you go. Display made. <laughs> right? Display made. That's what I do. But, um, typically when I have my gun, I'm either I'm in the woods hunting by myself, and um, I've had more than enough hair-raising, one in a million experiences that I've shared in stories earlier that I know to make sure I bring the equalizer. No matter what I do, no matter what I'm doing. But anyway, sorry for babbling. I didn't mean to dominate your story with my dumbass babbling. Babbling. Appreciate your email, man. Appreciate it. You got anything else you want to share one day that might help somebody here? Make sure you do it. Right. This is an interesting title: Flying Shed Antler. Love your videos. So I've had three. Well, maybe encounters in the past. The last one was at a climb at Feather Falls, California, just east of Lake Oroville. Me and my buddy decided to go hiking, and not on the best day. Raining like a chicken drowned, 
raining like a chicken drowner and cold. Well, for California boys. At the trailhead parking lot, there were no cars, probably because of the weather. On the way in and on, one way in and one way out. We hiked to the falls, got some pics, and moved out to head back and get out of the weather. Never saw another hiker on the entire trip. So, I was walking behind my buddy, who was not more than 10 feet in front of me, when out of my peripheral vision, I saw something coming at me at a high rate, and instinctively, I had to duck to avoid it. It just missed my head. I thought, what the F was that? I looked down, and it was a deer shed antler. It wasn't my buddy playing tricks on me, and there was nobody in the same area that could have thrown it. Food for thought. All my best. Matt. Houston. Houston? Houston. H-U-S-T-O-N. Houston, uh, P.S. I still have the antler. No shit. Send it to me, man. Send me a picture of it. I want to see how big it is. And you know what? I don't give a shit who you are. You get hit in the head with a flying antler, it's not going to be good. That's creepy, because you guys know that I am 110% convinced that something other than a canine or a bear left a massive blacktail shed antler for me specifically on the trail I was on. And I've had that particular mountain carpet bomb with trail cameras for like 16, 17 years. Never had a human on those cameras once. I'm the only one up there. That's kind of a shitty thing to do to somebody. Throwing a goddamn boomerang with points on it at their head. Not fair. Unless it knew you were going to see it coming. Actually, it probably did. Let's face it. If one of those beings wanted to smoke you in the head and see if it could make a shit antler stick out of your skull, it would do it. Actually, it'd probably just go up and grab you and stuff it in your head. <laughs> it would probably be a little more accurate and easier. All right. Thanks for sending that in, man. Especially the area, too. I appreciate the area sent in for people who live around the same zones. This is titled High Mountain Valley, B.C. That would be British Columbia. I live in a small town in a high mountain valley in B.C. For years, I've hiked the various trails around the area, alone with my dogs, and never felt threatened or scared. Prior to this, our family had horses, and I rode the hills into the wilderness without ever once feeling fear. Now, I don't want to go into the mountains. Sorry. Now, I don't want to go into the mountains to hike anymore, even though I dearly miss it. Here's my story. About ten years ago, I had discovered a new place to hike, and it was well it was a well-known spot. But for some reason, I had never been there before. On this day, mine was the only car in the parking lot, and I was glad because it meant that I had the whole place to myself. Parking in the highest and most remote spot, I let my dog out, the big German Shepherd. And we took off into the woods on the trail that was right there. It was beautiful country. Old Ponderosa pines, Saskatoon bushes, and sage. The air smelled wonderful, and we walked about a kilometer or so into the forest and reached a small box canyon where the path took a sharp left turn through some rough brush. Just at the turn was a huge stump. It must have been 11 to 13 feet tall and just as wide. I remember wondering what the heck kind of tree it must have been to make that stump, as there was nothing around that was that big and odd looking. Just as we passed it, about 25 feet along the path through the brush, the dog suddenly stopped and whirled around to face the stump. The whites of his eyes were showing and he looked utterly terrified. Suddenly I felt very scared, and although I had run toward that stump, sorry, and although I had, I had to run toward that stump again, along that path to get back to the parking lot, it took only a split second to make that decision, and yet and get the heck out of there. Not that I stopped to look, but I saw nothing at the stump. I don't think my feet touched the ground all the way back to the parking lot. Years later, I looked at that spot on Google Earth map to see if the stump was still there. At that time, the magnification was such that one could see that kind of detail easily. There was no stump there. I did follow the trail that I've been walking on, Google Earth, and just a short distance further along from where I had turned back, there was a teepee structure clearly visible. My curiosity was piqued, so I took my different dog back to the area to see what might be there. First visit, I threw some apples into the bush from the car. Second visit, I tied a bag of apples to a tree. 
Third visit, right where I tied the apples to the tree, I saw a footprint in the mud that was all of 20 inches long and at least 10 to 12 inches wide. The big toe was the size of a tennis ball. It was a very fresh print. I left the area kind of unnerved but still curious, not realizing that this, this might be kind of dangerous. There was an event in the area the next time I went up, so I felt safer and got out for a wee hike. Occasionally I would just stand there on the little rises to see if I could see anything, and I heard someone call my name inside my head. Out loud I said, I heard that from where I stood, I could see that there were people coming up from the parking lot about 150 feet away, so I left, kind of thrilled and not knowing what to think. The next time I went up, I was sitting in the parking lot in the car looking at the rock cliff in front of me, when all of a sudden, my view of reality started to change. It kind of morphed into a geometric pattern, like the petals of a daisy overlaying one another. And the petals started to move and get smaller and smaller, like a tunnel almost, and I suddenly felt great danger and looked away quickly. It was like this thing was a trap of some sort. I fled the parking lot immediately. An indigenous lady told me that she had once seen something they called rock people in this area, and I don't know if this is what that was or, or what. It was weird and terrifying, and I feel like if I hadn't have looked away, I would have been sucked into another reality of some sort. It crossed my mind that this kind of experience might be what is happening to at least some of the people that go missing in the mountains in the 411 series, for example. I think if it was a Sasquatch that did that, it seems out of character, as they could have snatched me up or harmed me on numerous occasions if they wanted to. I've had other experiences as well and never felt scared. This probably sounds very crazy. I get it. But I felt I should tell the story, as I have now read of other people that have had similar experiences to mine. So maybe we can warn others that there is something strange going on out there. Be careful. Please don't use my name, and I left the fuzzy and I left the location fuzzy on purpose. But I would love to know if you decide to use my story. I hope there is a horse in the background. Love your horses. They look sleek and happy. Beautiful. Thanks for all you do. Best wishes, Susan. Okay, Susan. How about uh? So you only checked out that trail from Google Earth, right? Why don't you take somebody with you? Take a couple people and a couple dogs and just whip up there real quick and see if see if that stump is absolutely gone and maybe take a, a photograph of that bend and, and exactly where the stump was. Maybe. If you feel like it. <laughs> I know it's a little unnerving. If I was nearby, I'd go with you. I'd go with you in a second. And uh, it's too bad you can't go hiking anymore. You don't. But you know what? Bring a dog. Just take baby steps. Go where there's other people. But don't just... Don't just throw away your uh, the real world experiences altogether. Try not to anyway. All right. It's not fair to get get robbed of that. So many people get robbed. All right. What do we got? Oh, Mark, this is red. This is titled Lacine. I know where that is. That'll be Kansas. That's where we used to go on the big. Turkey hunting competition. Hey Steve, I really enjoy your channel. Keep up the good work. My encounter is short, but did happen. So everyone knows I'm a hunter and fisherman. I love the outdoors. I've coon hunted this area over by the power plant in Lacine, Kansas my whole life. I know where that is. Exactly where that is. I'm from Missouri, but live on the Kansas and Missouri line. Anyway, I just got done in the hayfield and was going to get my girlfriend at the time and go to town. When we got to town, we ran into some friends from school and we all jumped in my truck. Me and my girlfriend and a buddy and his girlfriend. We cruised the strip for a while and was supposed to go to the movies, but we decided to go parking. You know parking, lol. Anyways, it was pitch black. I had a six cell flashlight, so, so my and my girlfriend went one way. I'm thinking that me and my girlfriend went one way, and my buddy and his girlfriend went the other way. Was there about 30 minutes and things were going my way when I heard big, heavy footsteps coming right towards me and my girlfriend. I hit the light and asked my buddy if he could hear it, and he said yes. 
we were about 50 yards apart. I shined the light toward the sound. It stopped when I yelled. I swear, Steve, I see nothing, and those lights are bright. We didn't smell anything or see eye shine. Nothing, my girlfriend was... Nothing. My girlfriend was starting to freak out, so we all left. Never said anything, never said anything going home, and never went coon hunting there again. I mushroom hunt it in daylight only and pack a 40 cal Glock with me. You can share and use my name, don't care. My name is Dave Rankin. Thanks for letting me tell my story, your friend Dave Rankin. Okay, Dave, appreciate it, man. It's uh, definitely more than a few times something like that's did the old block, right? How about that one? Remember the time you guys that the man wrote in about him and his wife were out there in the woods doing the same thing and, and they saw this thing and he got up. No. He has seen it or screamed. It screamed and he got up and took off running and left her laying there on the blanket. <laughs> what a dick. But anyway. Yeah, where I'm familiar with those teenagers were coming in down the main highway there and that power plant would be off to my right heading west, I think. And then on the right-hand side, there would be a few, uh, there's a store, a small store, a few uh, cabins for rent there, and then just up that side road was where we would go to that main lodge and uh, and stay for uh, five days, I think, and we would compete in that, uh, was it called the World Turkey Hunting Competition? Yeah, very familiar there. We 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 went to Lacine more than a few a few years in a row for sure for sure. But I never had any strange feelings there. While we were turkey hunting, big country, flat flat land, not too many big hills around where we were there. <clears throat> anyway, that would be a water bomber or a military plane flying overhead. But I'm gonna get going. I got a lot to do. I'm glad we got a handful of uh, a bunch of voices heard today. Hopefully more than my voice heard. And. Uh, Keep emailing it in, you guys, to share my story, howtohunt.com. All right, so there's another another group of people been heard today. And believe me, there are thousands more waiting. Thousands. <laughs> thousands. So many people come forth, forward with honest truth. It's amazing. It's, I'm, I'm feeling the more I realize how significant the number of people here are, is lately is what has made me realize just how much of an effort has been put forth to keep this topic stuffed into the dirt. It's amazing, isn't it? Don't you think so by now? It's absolutely amazing the effort to keep these truths questionable. Deny, 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 right? Or, okay, well, we'll let a couple of groups exist to appease some of you, but they're going to keep you going in circles too. You know what I mean? It's amazing. The effort is absolutely mind-boggling. There's a lot of big efforts out there that are mind-boggling to keep us away from truth. Why is that? Oh, this sucks.
Whew. Oh boy, I'm really starting to hate these parts of it. <laughs> so much fun, so much fun hiking in these places and finding these spots, but uh, this part is not fun. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. Shit. Uphill slope again. Thank God. Uh. There we go.